So uh, let me start by thanking the organizers by putting this, uh, putting this workshop together and asking you to speak. Um, I should start by telling you a little bit about what you're looking at, uh, just in terms of the, um, the website and the format. Um, so the website is CoCalc, which used to be called Sage Math Cloud. So this is William Stein's cloud platform for Sage and other computing software. Um, this file is something called a Jupyter Notebook. There's something called Project Jupyter, which um, essentially defines a format for integrating text with executable code. So this file, this file once I scroll down far enough, we'll start to see the executable code. Um, let me go ahead and run all of it now so that it will be, some of the cells take a little bit longer to run than others, so they'll all be done by the time I get to them. But, uh, that proves that I'm not cheating. I really, uh, I didn't pre-compute any of well, I, test, I, I tested this, but uh, the computation is happening just now. Um, and it's happening using the most recent version of Sage, which is 8.1. Um, I'll say a little bit more about uh, Sage in a moment. Um, I should also say that this file, uh, you, can, you can retrieve this file if you want, if you, uh, rather than give you the link, I'll just tell you, if you go to my website and click on Talks, you can find it. Um, and, um, just click on the website this uh, conference. Huh? Um, yeah, I, don't, I, can, I can give the organizers uh, a link as well. Um, so, and then there'll be some references. I should, so a few of you were at a talk I gave in Trieste last September. Uh, so this is follow-up on that, so some of this uh, may look familiar, but uh, has progressed further since then. Okay, so let me start by setting my notation for hypergeometric equations. So I'll have two n-tuples, alpha, under, alpha underline and beta underline, um, of some length n, they'll consist of rational numbers which I'll normalize to be uh, in the interval, half of an interval from zero to one, um, and I want to be in the irreducible case, so alpha should be disjoint from beta, but for the time being, there can be repeats. Uh, later, I'll need to uh, insist that beta doesn't have any repeats, but for the moment, alpha and beta um, can both have repeats. Um, and for most of the talk, I'm going to be interested in the Galois stable case, so any two fractions with the same denominator uh, occur with the same multiplicity wherever they appear. Um, of course, they can't appear in both alpha and beta, but if one third appears, then two thirds should appear with the same multiplicity. Um, okay, so uh, whether or not you have uh, a Galois stable datum, you can construct the associated hypergeometric equation. So I'm going to normalize the situation as in Corpus Heckmann. Um, so that means that the betas are going to be the residues at zero, are going to be exponents at zero, and the alphas will be exponents at infinity. Um, t will denote uh, the log derivation at t equals zero. Uh, so I'm going to be focusing a lot on what happens around t equals zero. Um, so in particular, if uh, for any given i, if beta i is distinct from the other betas, then I can, well, I can do this anyway, I suppose. Um, I could form this formal solution. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I don't need this condition, right? I have this formal solution. Uh, always makes sense, right? I take the um, or because I normalize things so that I don't have any uh, non-integer different uh, integer differences other than zero, um, if I shift uh, everything by beta i minus one, um, and then use the hypergeometric series f and f n minus one, then I do get a solution. Well, modulo multiplied by the appropriate power, of fractional power of t. So. Talk where I edited, edited I it on the fly, but it's possible to do that. Um, anyway, so that's 
just setting notation um, and my convention for where the where, where what the alphas and the betas refer to. Um, so um, it's, so it's come up several times already that if I take a Galois stable datum, then I can define a one parameter family of motives uh, where the parameter runs through p1 avoiding 0, 1, and infinity. Um, and the Durham realization of that, um, if I take a period and, and, and pass from the gauss mining connection to the corresponding Gauss-Fuchs equation for that period, uh, I kick out a hypergeometric equation with these parameters. Uh, so we've this is we've seen this uh, collection of this family over and over again for various choices of alpha and beta over the course of the last couple of days. Um, and in particular, uh, we heard about the magma hypergeometric modus package, which computes the L functions associated to members of this family. Um, so a few months ago, um, a Sage developer named Frédéric Chapoton, who I've actually not met, uh, he's not a number theorist, I don't think. I think he's a, he's a combinatorialist. Um, for reasons that I do not know, uh, he started porting uh, this magma package into Sage. So he wrote some code. Um, it wasn't completely functional. Uh, I mean, it, it was sort of working, but it had some bugs. Um, so at some point I got I noticed about I noticed this I got involved we fixed all the bugs um, I think we fixed all the bugs and as of the the latest version of Sage um, there is this port available and uh, I can, so this is the documentation for it I can just follow the link in my in my document you get to yes is it possible to use eight point white or do you can just use eight zero no, eight point. This is only this is this was, is, was added between eight point zero and eight point one. So, right, eight point zero was the current version last summer, and this was added in October or something. Um, yeah. So this is, is not a complete port of Magma's package. In particular, um, so it has the creation functions and the basic combinatorial functions. Um, and it has a function called Euler factor, which I'll come back to. Um, but it only took, but uh, right now it only includes primes of good reduction. It, I'll remind you what that means um, in a moment. But uh, it does not contain the, the uh, I guess these are still conjectural formulas for the Euler factors at tame and wild primes. Um, there is also a normalization difference. Um, so the Sage package uh, uses the normalization that I gave at the beginning. So uh, that corresponds to switching T with one over T compared to nine. So uh, okay, but uh, so yeah, if you wanted to uh, run this, you import the hypergeometric data function and you. So in parallel with magma, you create a hypergeometric datum associated to lists of parameters. You have several input options uh, analogous to the ones in magma, but I'm going to focus on the one where you specify exponents because since I'm, I'm showing you, exp I'm writing everything in uh, on the theoretical side in terms of exponents, I'm going to stick to using exponents for the entry. Um, so the degree of the, the hot structure that comes back out uh, is just the lengths of these two vectors. That's, is, is this running now? Is this what uh, I ran it at the, yes, I, 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 ran the, I ran these things when I started the lecture. So these have already, right, so you can see, you can see the timestamps here. That's when I, when I started. Um, yeah, so, so. Nothing is taking very long so far because we haven't done anything serious yet. When we get to order of factors, mm -hmm. then some time actually is required. Um, so the degree is just the length of these vectors. The weight of the Hodge numbers uh, come from a combinatorial formula that we, we saw um, in Mark's lecture. Um, so there's this function that I call it, I don't know if this, what the standard name for this is, I call this the zigzag function. Um, 
that uh, counts, um, sort of, it sort of goes up every time you cross an alpha and it goes down when you cross a beta. Um, and so you can read off the Hodge vectors from this, and in particular, um, the, 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 the highest non zero component tells you what the minimal weight is. Okay. So again, so far this is just porting combinatorial uh, expressions that are already implemented in magma. Um, okay, so how do L functions associated to hypergeometric motives look? Well, they have a bunch of features that are generic to L functions, uh, to arithmetic L functions. Um, so if T is in some number field, uh, the L function will be an Euler product over finite places of the number field. I'm not going to put in the Archimedean factors right now. Um, this, that's a separate story. And I'm also not really worried about the bad reduction factors either. I'm just going to focus on, on the good reduction factors. And what does it mean that a prime is good? Well, P should not divide the denominator of any of the alphas or betas. Those primes are called wild. And it also has to be the case that t and t minus 1 have p at evaluation 0. Um, if this fails and we're not wild, we say p is tame. Um, OK, so if you have a good prime, so let me focus on good primes hereafter. If p is good and its absolute norm is little q, then this polynomial has degree exactly n, otherwise it might be less. Um, the Hodge numbers give you a lower bound on the Newton polygon. Uh, when, that, when that's equality, you call p ordinary, and that's somehow supposed to occur most of the time, but uh, this is not such an easy thing to prove. Um, there's a functional equation uh, with an explicit sign. Uh, the sign is plus in, in, in the case of odd weight. In the case of even weight, there's some explicit formula for it, depending on uh, some quadratic character. And uh, this thing will be pure of weight, the minimal weight that was computed combinatorially. So that tells you where the complex roots of this thing are. So for example, um, if you just, I pick some, some p, some parameter value. I'm just, I'll always take k equals q for the demonstration in this lecture. And then, um, so I take the hypergeometric data that I constructed earlier, and I ask for the Euler factor. View it as a function, a polynomial in some variable t. So then this is just demonstrating that the functional equation is satisfied. Um, and this is demonstrating that the purity is satisfied. I took the, I found the roots over the complex numbers and took the uh, norm to the minus 2, and I'm getting uh, 17 to the power of 2, which is the way. In demonstration seven, you say that this demonstrates that it meets the functional equation, but don't you use the functional equation to actually compute that? It's, you're not really. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, we we did. I mean, yeah. So this is not. This is I right. The, the computation of this. Uh, I mean, you could rewrite the. Yes. There is a way to, to to call this so that it doesn't depend on the functional yes. equation. But yeah, for efficiency, we actually do use the functional equation. So this is just demonstrating that the answer is something sensible. Uh, yeah. uh, so how is this number being computed? Well, it's computed using a trace formula that we saw earlier. I won't give more than a high-level description of it, but uh, this was, the formula was flashed on the, the screen during Mark's talk. Um, so let me just give you the translation between this Euler factor and a trace formula. It writes the usual uh, Fredholm determinant that we've seen several times, most recently in the previous lecture, this, this polynomial has the form dead 1 minus t times blah, where F, this blah, fp, is an endomorphism of cer a certain vector space of dimension n over some field of characteristic 0. Um, and if you want to compute this L polynomial, um, it would be enough to compute uh, traces of some powers of this endomorphism uh, up to the point where the symmetry given by the functional equation takes over. Okay? And so uh, let me, for the purposes of this paragraph, let me change my notation slightly. Let me let Q stand temporarily for not the norm of, of this P, but the, 
some power of it, uh, let me denote, in that case, let me denote this trace by h sub q alpha beta t. Okay, this is, uh, this notation I think is the one out of Berkut's cohen mellet where they give this explicit formula in terms of Gauss sums that is not directly implemented in magma. It's, it's implemented via the gross Kolbe's formula to translate it to a formula involving the p-adic gamma function. And so that's what's implemented in, uh, in magma and likewise in SAGE. So uh, if you actually want to see the formula, you can go back to the magma documentation or this file that Mark has about it, um, which, uh, I th yeah, this is, the, this, is the, this is the file that we were seeing during Mark's talk. Uh, again, watch out for the normalizations, but aside from that, you can, uh, so the only, the only feature of the formula that I want to isolate for the purposes of this discussion is that it's a sum that involves Q minus one terms. So it's a pol it, more precisely, um, if you have uh, some t, well, you take uh, the reduction of t mod p, you take the Teichmuller of it, and you have some polynomial in that whose degree is q minus 2. Um, so it's a sum over q minus 1 terms. When, and and you're, you're evaluating it for norm of p up to about n over 2. Uh, when n gets large, this can be an issue. So I'll show you a... Uh, a kind of example of this uh, once we've, I've shown you the rest of this material, so I'll show you what happens when n gets kind of large. Uh, so I should point out that at the moment, the magma implementation is substantially more efficient than the SAGE implementation. I haven't quite figured out why, but uh, I haven't worked on it too much because I've mostly been interested in this other approach. So, uh, so there is some room for improvement in, in Possibly the way that uh, we're, we're handling a lot of calculations involving PF gamma functions. But. Really well, I, mean, I got that all from uh, Andre. I mean, basically, at this conference in Benas, you know, his code, like for 10 straight days, he doubled how fast it's, it's, it was. Yes. So it was like a thousand times faster than the other days. I see. Yeah. So, so, so we haven't done very like a, you know, like, Yeah, so this, this has not gone through very many. This has gone through maybe three or four doublings at this point. So. And I wasn't planning to spend that much time on it because I got interested in this, uh, this aspect. <laughs> yes. Um, right, so I want to contrast um, using this trace formula to computing the Frobenius structure. So we heard about these Frobenius structures a lot in the previous lecture. Um, so I should just preface by mentioning that uh, there are other examples that exist of implementing computing Frobenius structures. Uh, Alan Lauder uh, uh, calls this the deformation method for computing zeta functions of, of varieties, and he's implemented in some cases. Uh, there's a very nice implementation by, um, I think it's Pankratz and Teltman, uh, for hyperliptic curves. Uh, I know, actually, it works for, for some hypersurfaces and projective spaces. Um, the, the general difficulty with computing a Frobenius structure on, on a Gauss-Mannian connection is that it depends on how many singularities you have. So hypergeometric motives are, are sort of the most favorable test case because you have as few singularities as there could possibly be. So this is, a, this is more or less a demonstration of the example of, of how to use this method um, to compute zeta functions of things. Um, okay, so uh, I should say a little bit more about this mysterious vector space. So remember I told you this, there's an endomorphism acting on a mysterious vector space. What is that vector space? Well, it's the output of some vague cohomology theory. And, and in particular, there are multiple choices for what fields to take um, and where the theory comes from. So the most commonly uh, used choice in theory is a tau cohomology where you take k to be uh, QL or possibly some finite extension of QL where L is some prime other than um, P, the rational prime underlying Gothic P. Um, however, um, for computational purposes, it turns out to be uh, more useful to use uh, various piatic vague cohomology theories like Dwarf cohomology or crystalline cohomology. Um, these are somehow closer to explicit computations. 
Um, so it's much easier to explain to a computer how to compute with a door cohomology or crystalline cohomology than a top cohomology. Um, and there is some, some gap in the, the theory between the two, but this gap has closed a lot over the past 20 odd years. So uh, for, the, for many practical purposes, you can sort of set aside the existence of a top cohomology and, and work directly with PNN cohomology because even the theory is functional. Um, so the approach that I'm going to describe for computing these, these uh, Euler factors involves computing to some suitable p-adic precision the matrix by which this, uh, this mysterious endomorphism acts on some particular basis of p-adic cohomology. Uh, well, this will be p-adic crystalline cohomology, say, or well, rigid cohomology. This crystalline cohomology requires proper varieties. Um, in any case, the point is that K is going to be something like QP, or maybe some finite extension of QP, but in practice, in my examples, it will be QP. Um, and the point is that uh, when you do p-adic cohomology, uh, p-adic cohomology has a nice behavior in families. Uh, when you take the individual matrices by which um, Frobenius acts for various specializations, those, those are themselves uh, specializations of some p-adic analytic family of matrices that has something to do with the hypergeometric equation. This is the so-called Frobenius structure. Okay. So, what is the Frobenius structure of a hypergeometric equation? Well, to say what this is, I have to translate into, uh, I have to basically translate to language of connections, but instead of using the word connection, let me just write down matrices. Um, so, Replace the hypergeometric equation with its companion matrix, um, which I for some reason I computed the companion matrix, just to show you that I could. I'm not actually going to use it. But. So here's the companion matrix in this example. Um, so a Frobenius structure on this. Well, so let me let me consider the Galois stable case. In the Galois stable case, what I want to do to define a Frobenius structure is compare this connection with this Frobenius this pullback, where Frobenius here is going to be taken to be the substitution t goes to t to the p. So I want to compare the connection with its uh, sigma pullback, and that amounts to writing down a matrix that satisfies this relation. So this is just the explicit version of the commutation relation that we saw, for example, in the previous lecture. So the catch is that the entries of f will not be uh, algebraic. They're not rational functions um, of t, uh, even if I allow qp coefficients. Uh, rather, they are some sort of analytic functions on, on some subspace of qp, of p1 over qp. So they'll be defined on some subspace which contains the entire residue disk away from the singularity, 0, 1, infinity. Um, uh, you'll, get, you'll get a mirror morphic on each of the disks containing zero or infinity. You'll get a mirror morphic function with singularities only at zero and infinity. Um, and something funny happens at one. So you get a little bit of convergence into the residue disk at one, but uh, not all the way. So this has to do with the fact that uh, the sigma is chosen so that it's totally ramified at zero and infinity, but not at one, because I only get to choose two points where it's totally ramified. Um, so things behave nicely at zero and infinity for that reason, but uh, at one, things are more complicated. So, um, so conceptually, I have this, uh, uh, this funny subspace of P1 where things are defined. What does this mean concretely? Well, what, when I write down F p approximately, I'm going to truncate and then I will just uh, represent by some rational function which has poles at zero, infinity, and roots of unity. So it'll be a, uh, it'll be a rational function where the denominator looks like, well, it may have some power of t in it and some power of t to the p minus 1. OK, so, so I claim this, this, is a, this is the right definition in the Galois stable case. In the general case, this doesn't work because 
you don't actually get an isomorphism with the, with the sigma pullback. And the reason is, well, what is the effect of the sigma pullback on the exponents? Well, it multiplies them by p. And in order for that to give me something that's isomorphic to what I started with, when I multiply by p, I have to get back the same collection of exponents modulo integers. And that uh, happens in the Galois stable case, but in general it might not. So in the general case, what I have to do is compare the original connection with the one associated with the datum where I multiply by p and reduce mod 1. So this, of course, depends on some congruence condition on p. If p is somehow sufficiently close to 1 adequately, then n prime will equal n, but it will, uh, there's some congruence condition in general. Right, so this somehow is, this is related to the fact that the, the hypothetical hypergeometric motive that's supposed to be associated to, N, to, to the datum in this case is not a motive with coefficients in Q, it's a, it has coefficients in some subatomic field, and so really you're supposed to be thinking about primes um, in that subatomic field. So that, that's, that's what throws the congruence condition in it. Um, so the Stravenius structure is known to exist uh, and is unique up to some QP scalar multiplication um, because I haven't told you how to normalize things yet. Um, in the Galois stable case, it turns out that you can normalize it so that it actually produces Euler factors. So if T is in this unramified extension, Q sub P to the K, then the matrix of FP uh, will be given by, well, I take T, reduce mod P, and lift back by um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to talk about this person this, since I was reading about you know, hmm. persecution of Hausdorff in this building. Um, but anyway, so you, you take the multiplicative lift back to QP to the K, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, and so then what you do is you, 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 plug that into, you plug that into F and then you take the norm. So that has, that has the effect of, well, you, you evaluate at the various powers and then you write you, you take this product, which I think I've written in the correct order, I meaning i equals zero is on the left, i equals k minus one is on the right. Um, if not, then it's the other way around. But uh, anyway, in this, in this lecture, I'm only going to consider the case k equals one, so I don't have to worry about the order. I'm really just specializing at Teichmuller of the reduction of t. But I do want to emphasize the fact that uh, this Fermanius structure will itself be something that uh, lives over uh, some sp subspace of P1QP, so even if you want to evaluate at some point in some larger field, you're going to be computing some power series with coefficients in QP and, specialize, and then specializing possibly into some larger field. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so there's this book of, of work on generalized hypergeometric functions, which I've been staring at recently, and if I understand Correctly, uh, he proves that uh, you can sort of construct a Fermanius structure, uh, which is itself a locally analytic function of alpha and beta, which is to say, on residue classes mod p, it's actually analytic. Um, and then again, there's some uniqueness up to normalization. But I don't actually know um, if this construction can be reconciled with the geometric normalization. Presumably, the answer is yes, but uh, that needs to be checked, uh, which is to say somebody needs, somebody, either me or somebody who can read dwarf better than I can, needs to go in there and see if one can confirm that, um, apparently, maybe I'm supposed to ask Adelson this question, given that uh, Adelson has looked at this, uh, as was mentioned earlier today. But in any case, I have not confirmed that this general analytic construction of Fermanian structures can be normalized uh, in the correct geometric way. But, I'm expecting that it can be. Anyway, so um, so let's so this talk is supposed to be about computing things. So let me ha tell you and then show you um, how you compute this Fermanian structure for a particular data. So the point, which uh, again came up in the, in the previous lecture, is that the commutation relation between the Fermanian and the connection matrices amounts to uh, imposes a, a differential equation on the entries of f. And so you can solve that differential equation uh, using the known solutions of the hypergeometric equation plus some initial condition. 
And so, of course, you have to figure out where, where to get an initial condition. Um, so we'll come back to that. But let me, let me uh, demonstrate what's going on for, uh, in the case where I have a Yahweh stable datum, and now I want to insist that beta uh, has distinct values. Um, because in that case, it's easy to write down a full basis of solutions of the hypergeometric equation. Um, you essentially take the candidate that I gave you at the beginning, and I just take all of those. Um, so I, the way I'm going to write this is I'm going to separate off the fractional power of t and write the, the, the genuine, genuine series as y sub i. So y sub i, well, except I'm going to put a normalization in here. But up to a normalization, y sub i is the, hyper, the nf n minus 1 that I wrote down earlier. Uh, the normalization is some it's just some rational number. Um, yeah, so it depends on, on uh, whether these things are positive or, or, or not. This is, this is chosen to simplify the formula that I'm going to state later. Uh, when I was originally doing these computations, I didn't have this normalization in there, and then I, I got some more complicated expression um, for the initial condition. So. I'm changing this around to put this in the normalization. Okay, so then I can, uh, I'll, have, I'll write what I'll call the formal solution matrix, which is not literally a solution matrix because uh, I'm not, to, to, to have a literal solution matrix, I would have to include the fractional powers of t. Um, I don't want to put those in there. So, um, so instead, I, I just take y, and then instead of differentiate, I sort of shift the differential by the effect of this power of t. And then that has the effect that if I uh, conjugate n by u, which is done by this kind of formula, so if I change basis by u in the connection, then the new connection has uh, um, uh, its matrix given by the diagonal matrix with these values. Okay. So. This u, of course. So right now I'm just working in the realm of power series, a formal power series around t equals zero. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, what, what happens if some bit is closer? If, so, if, I'm sorry? If, if uh, yeah, so if you have the same bit as... Uh, oh, then these won't be linearly independent. This, this matrix will not have full rank. I'll come back to that case at the end. But, yeah, so I need, I need, this, to, I need this to have full rank, and that will only happen if, mm -hmm. if these things are distinct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a so there's a function that computes this, which I'll skip, but it just does exactly the same thing that I said. Um, okay. So so to compute f, what I'm going to do is I'm comp going to comp I'm going to figure out what it is in terms of this transformed basis. So I'm going to compute the uh, so f naught will be the conjugate of f. Uh, and so when you conjugate the Frobenius structure, the, 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 the skew conjugation looks like this. Um, and, and you know you've done this right because you again have a commutation relation between uh, n naught and f naught. Um, but now, since uh, n naught is just a diagonal matrix, this has the following consequence. And again, here I'm using the fact that uh, I have distinct values for this consequence to be correct. Uh, the only time I get the only entries that appear in F0 are some transversal. Um, uh, it's the transversal where beta i is congruent to P beta j mod 1. Right? So the fact that this, the fact that the, that these, that this is a transversal uh, is because I'm in the Galois stable case. So otherwise there might not exist such a transversal, and that's why we'd have to use the n and the n prime. But Right now, I'm, I'm showing you the Galois stable case. Um, so, so you know exactly where the non-zero entries have to occur, and you also know that they have to be this particular power of t times some scalar. And so the question of, of computing the initial condition is to identify these scalars. So I'm, I'm, my, I'm, I'm, taking, I'm going to propose uh, an initial condition at the singular point t equals zero, but because I have distinct Exponents there. Um, this is or this is uh, not such a reasonable thing to do. 
And here's the conjecture for what the scalar is. Um, it's some particular, so it has some expression involving the zigzags. So this sort of shapes the, the Hodge polygon in the correct way. Um, and then you have some product of gammas, which uh, is meant to look like um, one of the expressions for the trace formula that we saw uh, so I mark slot. Um, so this kind of expression where you have these differences um, reduced mod one, um, and you take the p out of gamma of those, these things appear in the formula. And in fact, this formula was essentially guessed by staring very carefully at that. Um, well, basically this formula was guessed by looking at the trace formula um, as a polynomial in, the, in bracket t bar, and taking the, the, the coefficient of degree zero and kind of sorting out the, uh, so that's some, that gives you some sum of terms. And so the guess was that, well, that's the trace of some matrix. So, um, well, that doesn't quite work. That doesn't quite, uh, that's not quite a valid argument when this is not the diagonal tra transversal because the trace will be zero in that case. But uh, I can talk more about how the guess was made a little bit later if there's time at the end and people are interested. But anyway, there was some creative guesswork involved in coming up with this formula. Um, but once you have it, you can... Uh, so I should mention, I think I wrote this on the slide later, but I'll mention this now. You can also try to guess this using the method that we heard about in, in Tuco's lecture, which is um, to use the fact that... Um, actually, I have it written right here. So when you go back, right, to go back from F0 to F, you compute u times f0 times sigma of u inverse, u and u inverse uh, converge to functions, um, actually, I suppose they, uh, sorry, u and u inverse are holomorphic functions, actually. Uh, it's f0 that has the pole. Uh, so this should say holomorphic functions. So u and its inverse are, are, are holomorphic matrix, well, their entries are holomorphic functions on the unit disk, but they don't extend uh, to any larger disk. Um, and that's sort of obvious because um, the coefficients, uh, right? If you have if you have a hypergeometric series, the coefficients will not be p-adically bounded. They'll have these slowly growing p-adic denominators. By contrast, uh, when you compute this product, you do get bounded coefficients, and you do get something that emits a neuromorphic continuation. Um, and so you can actually guess digits of the entries of F0 by, by looking for uh, a guess that gives you bounded coefficients. This is the process we saw in the previous lecture. Um, so I didn't do it this way, but uh, I, so I, I, had, I guessed some other way and then used this as a check. But, uh, so this is already a pretty good check, um, except, well, it doesn't detect some overall ZP scalar, but um, this is a pretty good check um, that your, your guess is, is close to being right. Okay, so now there are some more functions that, that compute sigma and then compute this product. Uh, Okay, and now there's the step where we evaluate. So I have, if I have a particular parameter value, which let me call it T0 to distinguish it from the, the coordinate of P1. Um, so I need to reduce this thing mod P, lift back by the multiplicative lift, and evaluate. Um, so of course I can't do this directly because the power series only converges um, in the range absolute value of T less than one. So what I have to do is, Reduce modulo of power of t, multiply by a suitable power of, well, the thing that clears the poles, so uh, in this case, t to the p minus 1, resolve that to a polynomial, evaluate, and then divide out by the factor that got thrown in by multiplying by this factor, t to the p minus 1. Yet again, we saw this process an hour ago, so I'm just doing the same process that Duga described on the board. Um, warning, if you actually want to do this correctly, you have to look carefully to figure out where to truncate things, because first of all, you're working with p-adic numbers, so that inherently involves some p-adic truncation, and you're doing, you're, you have these t-adic power series, which are going to truncate t-adically. So you have some two, two dimensions of truncation, 
Uh, of course, you want to get the answers right, so you don't want to truncate too much, but you want this to finish, so you want to truncate somewhere. Um, some analysis would be required to actually figure out what the levels are. We saw some concrete uh, examples of what the answers are supposed to look like in the previous lecture. The, for this demonstration, I just eyeballed all of this. So we're, we're just, these are these these are math, these are just guesses. These are not uh, particularly sensible choices for value because they just work <laughs> empirically. So I do some truncations and then I do exactly what I just said in this paragraph. Uh, that's these lines, and then. Um, when you try it, so reminder, I was using this hypergeometric datum earlier. Uh, T naught was, I believe, 3 and P was 17. Um, and I run all of this, and uh, you can see it takes a little bit longer. It took, this was more or less instant, and this took like five seconds. I should say that's a lot longer, but, but it does give the same answer. So, uh, we're going to on the right track. This is what T? A P equals 17. Right, so I can. Uh, no, I can't show you. Is it still only computing up to the cube term using a functional equation? Somehow? Yes. Uh, well, this one is. Okay. This one is computing the whole matrix. Okay. So this does not use the functional equation at all. So if you want this, this gives some independent verification. Okay. Because yeah, here I did here. Um, yeah, here I did not. Uh, yeah, there's no hidden use of the functional equation in, in this second. So obviously, I, I could have probably skewed, shaved the precision down a little bit if I was going to use a functional equation. But one aspect of what I explained is uh -huh. that uh, you can do with the same calculation, different piece. Mm -hmm. You do this too. Uh, or if for every next p, it will do the whole thing over again. Yeah, right. The way I've set this up right now, I'm doing I'm doing it over and over. I'm sort of throwing out the, the results from a previous p. Uh, it is probably the case that you can do something where you kind of do amortize do many p's and you amortize the computation over all p's. This is something that's been seen in the context of, for example, hyperelliptic curves. Um, there is this work by Harvey and Sutherland um, where they compute. Um, L series of hyperelliptic curves by some kind of method that amortizes a computation over different primes in a similar way that, that, that I think what you have in mind. Um, so it should be possible to do something like this. So John and I have been talking about this. Um, but in this talk, I'm, I'm just throwing away the results every time I start with the computer. Kiran, yes. In line 19, yes. are you actually computing it? Because you computed it above. Is it just cached and reloaded? Or oh, it probably is cached. Um, I mean, it doesn't take. It, even if you compute it from scratch, it takes. Uh, it looked to me like 10 seconds in line 3 or 2. Oh, well, I can. It was 10 seconds. I, so I think yours is faster. Uh, it was when I did this. Let's see if I can rerun the computation from scratch here. Let me yeah, there, there so here's the T naught and the P, so I need to re execute this cell. Um, and I need to re execute the cell where I find an H. Um, this might not work if one of the other computations is still running. Uh, oh, something else is still running, so I'll come back to that. So I, I think it was taken. When I, was, when I tested this at home, that, that was taking it maybe like a second or something, um, uh, the, the, the trace formula computation. And magma was even faster. Um, but if you would have P is uh, several hundred? No. Uh, if I make P larger than, oh well, so this, is, this rank is relatively small, so uh, this is there's, there's a lot of overhead in this computation the way I've, I've implemented it. Uh, let me show an example where the rank is much larger, and that will that will be illustrative. Which is T naught? T naught was three in this example. In the, in the way I describe, for a larger P it becomes quicker because you're multiplying the other series in T to the P. So you. Have, yeah, so here the problem is that the amount of, the, the t-adic precision depends on yes. p, right? Because the degree of the polynomial has a fact, is like a linear 
function of p. So I have to, so the t attic, the number of powers of t I have to carry grows linearly with p. Um, so that, so that, so yeah, that's that, the dependence on p uh, involves that. Um, okay, so I checked, I did a, a sample. Um, so this is basically choosing um, some random hypergeometric uh, motives of degree up to six and some random primes and testing whether um, the trace formula computation agrees with the Frobenius structure computation. And I've actually run this maybe 5,000 times. Um, and never, I haven't seen it, and it, it works except occasionally I discover that some cases don't have enough PI precision. But um, this seems to be working. So I believe this formula for the, for the, the initial condition. Um, so here's a larger rank example that I tried last night. Um, well, I, it, it just it ran, I ran it again just now, but I implemented this, or I checked it last night. So here I take a degree 12, right? I mean, I basically take the, degree, the sort of obvious guy of degree 12 and weight 11, so the parameters are, uh, the exponents are zero at the top and the x over 13 on the bottom. Um, and again, I take p equals 17, t naught equals three, take the Euler factor. So that took about 12 minutes when I ran it just now. Um, that's why I started this at the beginning, so that this would be done by now. Um, to, in order to compare this with Magma, so I, I, I don't have Magma installed on CoCalc because I would have to install it myself because CoCalc is a public thing and so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't ship Magma by default. Um, so I, I went to a different machine that I have control over that, run, that also has Magma and ran both of these. And uh, so the Sage trait formula computation was still running after six hours, but uh, Magma was able to do the trace formula computation in about three quarters of an hour. Um, this computation that I did in Sage with the Frobenius structure was much faster. And so you can see that, I mean, obviously this case is chosen to, this is, this is the case where this Frobenius structure approach should be better because the dependence on, uh, for given P, the trace formula computation has an exponential dependence on the, on the degree, whereas this has a polynomial dependence on the degree. So it makes sense that there should be a crossover, and I was happy that I could actually find a crossover, yeah. even with my code not being particularly uh, optimized. Yeah, but it, it's, it has T, and Magma has those. So yeah. this, is more, <laughs> this is more practical. But more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, the uh, method code is essentially taking 17 to the sixth time here, and yeah, the magma code actually has a cutoff if you if you put in a, a, a path, if you put in a parameters that are too large, it will just complain yes. at some point. It will stop at two to the 25th or two to the 28th. You're right at the, the yeah, end. yeah. So I, I, that's but if why. You're computing the L series, of course, you don't need the whole Euler factor. You can use other. Yeah, yeah. If you're computing, if you want to compute some number of digits of the uh, some number of coefficients of an L function, then you don't always need all of the Euler factor. You need less and less of it as the prime goes up. And, and also, of course, you can compute for all values of the parameter sort of the same. Yeah, you could compute the uniform. You mean you like compute the formula as a function of the parameter? Well, I mean that's if essentially. You, if you it. also want to compute it for one fourth or two, uh, yeah, so one of, then you do not have to recompute. That's right. That's two. right. I, that that yeah. The Frobenius structure has all that information yeah. all at once, so you you can refrain from throwing it out. You can sort of cache it and, yeah. and then use it if you want. Um, so that we're really using the wrong form. Yeah. So yeah, if, you, if you're doing, if you have the same hypergeometric data in multiple parameter values, you may want to use the frame structure multiple times. You could do the same thing with the trace form idea. It says it's only a type of variation to use one. Yeah, you actually have some methods to cache intermediate results. Well, I mean, what I was talking about being assumed more like a multi-polynomial evaluate. You you be evaluating the same polynomial at multiple points. Yeah. So, so here's some uh, additional issues that are not uh, resolved at this point. Um, so this is my last section. Um, 
So I have not tried to test, uh, I expect the conjecture tree to hold for non galois data, but uh, I haven't yet understood what it means to take a geometric normalization because that means I have to know what family of hypergeometric motives to look at when the coefficients are drawn in Q, and uh, I need to understand what that means. Um, but I mentioned that so that I can, I can give this next discussion, um, which ties back to something that came up in Duco's talk. Um, what if beta has multiplicity? What if beta has repeated terms? Um, I haven't done any computations in this case, but I think the way that I would want to do this both conceptually and actually to, to do the computation uh, is something like this. So suppose I have a range of betas that are equal and this value doesn't occur elsewhere. So essentially what I do is I introduce an infinitesimal epsilon, which I declare to be infinitesimal but positive. Uh, and then I, 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 spate, I, I take the betas to be equally spaced by this infinitesimal value epsilon. Um, and so by declaring epsilon to be positive, then I know how to interpret the previous formulas. Um, so for example, this, this term with a plus in it, um, I know how to interpret it because I know what, whether or not some multiple of epsilon is positive. So I use that interpretation. Um, now I have to think in terms of the Laurent series ring in epsilon with coefficients in power series uh, over QP. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm only going to need this modulo something like epsilon to the h. Um, but anyway, so I, I, I interpret, I correctly interpret the, this plus symbol and taking what gamma is mod 1. And when I put those things together, the expression that I get for f, once I, assume, once I take the initial condition and put it together with the, the hypergeometric stuff, that should give me an expression without uh, negative powers of epsilon, so then I should be able to set epsilon equal to zero and get the right formula. And this will, of course, produce derivatives of gamma of order up to h. And this is consistent with the theorem of Shapiro that we saw in the previous talk, where if you take uh, the Dorf pencil of cubic of quintic threefolds, then um, so beta is all zeros in this case, the matrix F0, the diagonal entries are 1, or well, the powers of p. And, and there's a unique off-diagonal entry, which can be expressed in terms either of zeta p of 3 or in terms of some derivatives of gamma, so gamma prime and gamma triple prime. So, so that, this is some indication of why that result of Shapiro should be indicative of the general case. But I haven't done any numerical tests to see if my formula is actually formulated correctly uh, when there are repeats. But if I had to guess, I'd guess I had it right on the nose the first time. Um, so it might be possible to both deal with this and uh, generalize to the GKZ case and maybe prove everything if one really understands what's going on this method in this book of the work and or the work of Adolfson that came up earlier this earlier today. Um, I haven't made any attempt other than staring a little bit at, at Dwork's book and getting befuddled uh, to, under, to understand what's going on, but it feels like there should be a way to write down a general argument that, that constructs a Verbania structure that has the right normalization. But, um, yeah, and one other thing that I haven't tried to do, but I would love to try at some point, is to uh, go backwards and, and use uh, information about the Frobenius structure derived from knowledge of this initial condition to, for example, recover the trace formula or possibly try to predict the existence of supercongruences, either in cases where they're known or possibly identify some cases that haven't already been identified. Um, this I haven't tried to do this at all, so I, uh, this is just idle speculation. But it, it seems like it should be possible to at least get the trace formula back from this other formula that, well, because I can take the Frobenius structure and take trace, that should, uh, that, that gives another trace formula, so the two should be equivalent, uh, but I haven't seen how off the top of my head. I'll start there. Is there 
something else that, I mean, it's going to have the Frobenius matrix, obviously that will be eventually, uh, when all settled much faster than the trace, but is there something else that one can get by knowing the Frobenius matrices that you, other than the, the order factor? Really? I mean, oh, well, I guess there's a question of what do these off-diagonal terms mean? Um, I don't know what they mean. They tell you, I mean, the, the fact that the one has zeta p3 in it presumably means it has something to do with some kind of motive or something. I mean, maybe, maybe Don has a, can speculate on this. Do you have any idea what I can do with the off diagonal terms? Well, if you encode some extension. Yeah. That takes mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Um, but in, 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 in over C, it's a sort of a, uh, it's a manifestation of this gamma class business. But that's. Well, and the thing that I see that I did in Spencer and Marshall did look, we, we go on beyond the, de the degree of the equation. So, like the printing, yeah. you have four Frobenius classes, then you continue on. Yeah. And up to 10, it's actually still in the world of the gamma conjectures, I see, they noticed, because there's a still that's a kind of dimension going up to 10, for which the original one was a sevenfold plane section. Mm -hmm. But after 10, it isn't, and you get these multiple things. Yeah. So whether there's any gamic story behind that, and it's anything to do, because if you can go on then, of course, you, you sort of complain at the end of your lecture that you have this one, these wonderful discoveries, but you don't need them after k equals 3 if you just want the L function, because it's not oh, burden on the PQ. But if you keep going, so it, it would be wonderful to yes, see. Of course. So in particular, when you get something like the adding multiple zeta values, and you take the clinic example, the other example. Yeah. So with this kind of implementation, we can do these experiments now. I don't know. I don't even know what the words mean, but it must be something. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, not knowing what the words mean is not an impediment to trying to That's for sure. around the numbers. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> Luckily. <laughs> Mathematics doesn't have to proceed in this. Bartosz, did you have questions? Yes, uh, so you mentioned this uh, time of complexity, right, for, for both algorithms. So you said that in some cases the trace formula is faster than the Frobenius? Yeah, I mean, experimentally, it's, it's, I, I, it, so far the, you know, when, when everything is small, it seems that the trace formula has been faster. I mean, it, it, it's computing less information because it's only really computing the trace rather than the whole matrix. Uh, and the formula has, you know, except for the fact that it, 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 it's a sum over Q terms, the terms are relatively simple. So uh, it's a pretty streamlined formula. So it has, so it has an exponential runtime, but with a very small cost of in front. So it makes sense that there would be a crossover. Uh, that it takes some, it takes a while to get to the point where doing this thing, which has a polynomial dependence on the rank and the degree, actually. So maybe you can actually so, combine both methods, right? Like. Yeah, I mean, the, if you if you just want Euler factors or you just want um, you know, partial Euler factors, you know, you would want to implement some switch that that decides which algorithm to use depending on the, on the parameter value. Is there is there a chance that this kind of like I don't know the, the dwarf stuff does it apply to the regular singularity? Or no, no, no. Uh, it could. Uh, I mean, you, I mean, we don't have any here. Where, so well, why you ask? You, you would have them. I mean, if there is this issue of, of primes about reduction that oh, might okay. require you, you actually deal with irregular. Ah, oh, oh, so if you wanted to extend this to, to say, wild tame or even wild primes, yes. potentially. Um, you, you, you'll have to face irregular things. Yeah, so for the tame primes, this doesn't come up. But for no. the wild primes, yeah, you, you might... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what will happen when you start trying to run the dwarf style computations with the. Well, in my experience, I mean, I've I had a little experience uh, computing on the Fourier transform set just because. Um, and you have one conceptual benefit. I'm not sure whether this conceptual benefit is also a computational benefit, which is things become less on, on, on the DM, right? Uh, of, that, of that they want. Uh, and you know certain things you do not have to. I mean, like instead of Padé approximations, you do power series. Uh, yeah. I mean, things. Yeah, certain things are out. Yeah. So, so yeah, if, if you if you figure out how to set things up, it, it probably the al the algebra actually gets simpler at some point. But uh, I haven't tried. More questions, comments? Well. 
Cake is waiting for us, so let's thank the speaker.